The following program is a West Tennessee PBS special presentation made possible through the generous financial support of viewers like you. Please visit westtnpbs.org and make a donation today so that we can continue to make local programs like this possible. Thank you. It's flu season across West Tennessee, and COVID, of course, is still a concern. Hello, I'm Julie Cook, and on this episode of Tennessee is Talking, the topic is our health. What are the big health concerns in this year so far? So let the conversation begin. That's so cool. And then that's when I said that. The problem with that idea is. Wow, that was amazing. Then I came up with a solution. What was that about? Here's what I think about it. Now we're talking. West Tennessee PBS presents Tennessee is Talking. Let the conversation begin. Thank you for joining us. I'm Julie Cook, and today we're talking about your health from COVID to flu and beyond. Ginger Rousey is with us. She is the public information officer for the Jackson Madison County Regional Health Department. And thank you for being with us. I know you and I have had the discussion before. It seems like right now there's a lot of sickness going around and there's a lot of different kinds. Yes. And yes. we wanted to kind of break that down. Um, uh, as far, we are in the flu season. Mm -hmm. So as far as that goes, how are we doing so far? Well, at, at this point in time, we've had, you know, experienced really high respiratory activity levels in, since December. And we are still in what we would consider a high respiratory activity level, but our numbers are beginning to trend down. So that's a good sign. Now, what we want to be aware of is that sometimes uh, for flu activity, we'll see a spike early in the season, and then we'll see another spike later as we get closer to the spring. So while our numbers do tend to be moving in the right direction, we want to stay vigilant and just continue to encourage people to take those extra precautions because flu season lasts, you know, through, through the early spring. Is it too late to get a shot for flu? It's not. It's really never too late to get a, a shot for flu as long as it is flu season. And um, an, another question that we get sometimes, Julie, is, well, if I've already had flu and I didn't get my shot, do I need to even still get a flu shot? And the answer to that is yes also, because there are different strains of the flu. So you may get flu A, and then later in the season, you could get flu Let's B. Get another so time. the flu shot covers four different strains of the flu. So, uh, you know, it's, it's still a good idea to get your flu shot. Now, is it, I've always understood that whatever vaccine you get this year was the most prominent strain of flu from the year before. Mm -hmm. Is that still how that well, yes. they try to anticipate what the dominant strains are going to be. Because they can only right. predict. Yes, it's really. We don't it, know it, until it gets it, here. It is a but, prediction. Yeah. And so, so it, it, I guess you could say it's an educated guess for, for a lot of the cases. But this year, what we're seeing is that the, uh, the flu shot is working really well against the strains that are circulating. I've heard so many people say, you know, I've been so sick mm -hmm. and I test negative for flu, right. test negative for mm -hmm. COVID, test negative for this or that. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, I guess when you say respiratory illnesses, right. there's just something, is there anything, are, are you breaking it down? Right, right. So how, when, how is when we working? think about respiratory uh, illness activity levels, um, what, what that's measuring is any time that a patient goes to a provider with symptoms of cough, sore throat, fever, those three symptoms. And, and just a combination of those, not necessarily all three, but cough, sore throat, fever. And they may or may not be testing positive for flu or COVID or RSV. It could be none of the above. So that's what we're measuring because sometimes, you know, we have these severe colds that aren't showing up on any of the tests, but we are still seeing people with those same symptoms. So when we talk about that, that's what we're measuring. But Looking at specifically flu and even COVID too, we have seen some elevated levels for both of those. For co so COVID is a little bit elevated. Sure, and it's point. again, it's, it's sort of following the trend of flu right now as we're seeing those levels decrease, um, but still maybe more elevated than we were perhaps last summer. I was thinking before, during the rage of the COVID, mm -hmm. that you typically test positive for about ten days, and I know I tested positive before Christmas, mm -hmm. and on a Monday and on Friday it was negative mm. because it, it just hit like a brick. Really? I mean, it was just mm. one, a, a couple of days like, wow, you know, and you think you're just sort of mm -hmm. tired. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then once I tested and then on Friday it was gone. Right. This is not the same strain of COVID. I, 
it seems like people have had different symptoms over the past few years when it was so deadly That's and dangerous. That's right. Well, and, and when we think back to 2020, that, and that was a novel virus, and none of us had ever been exposed. No one had any immunity. Um, and even though those strains have, um, you know, modified, we have different variants of the strains. Because you know, they the do Delta. mutate. They do, mm -hmm. they do. And they, they are... And that's another issue with COVID is that it mutates so quickly, more so than other viruses. Um, but because we have some immunity, because 85% of Americans had at least one version, a one shot of the COVID vaccine, and then others have had it. So we have a lot of natural immunity. We have the vaccine immunity. People have been getting their vaccines throughout the years. So it's not the shock to our system that it was at first. And um, a good thing that, you know, speaking with our epidemiologist at the health department, uh, a positive sign that they're seeing is while COVID can still be very dangerous, it can be deadly still, we are not typically seeing 30 year olds with no mm. underlying health condi conditions being placed in ICU with COVID. And that was something we were seeing four years ago. So those with heart conditions, mm -hmm. diabetes, uh, um, compromised immune systems, mm -hmm. that, that's all, it all can still be very oh, dangerous. Oh, absolutely. To COVID, and and it, can, it can be very dangerous to those, of course, over 65, even the very young. It, it's still, I don't want to underplay COVID too much, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's not, we're not seeing the devastating consequences to those that we would consider typically healthy as we were. And that was the issue with COVID is that it was, you may get it and have just a sniffle. Mm -hmm. And then someone else may get it and for no rhyme or reason, they uh, exactly. you know, had to be intubated. So it's, uh, that was why it was, it was so hard for a, a lot of people in the, in the health field um, to get their, wrap their minds around it because it was, it was just so, uh, you weren't sure exactly. The mystery. Yes, it was. And how it, it affected different people. Um, where we are now, because we've had We've had vaccinations, people have had it, so we've had some natural immunity. We've had natural immunity and vaccinations, which they're calling hybrid immunity, which seems to be really working well. Um, so it's, it, we're not seeing such as many severe cases as we were four years ago. Now you all aren't giving the COVID vaccines. We are, You yes, are yes. now. It, now, is, is that a particular type we or have, these boosters? We have Moderna or? only, and so this is the newest vaccine. It was updated in September of 2023. And I think moving forward, you know, we've had COVID vaccines, uh, the boosters or updates come out sporadically. Uh, I think moving forward, what we'll see is that the COVID vaccine will follow the flu vaccine. So we'll have a new vaccine every year. And that will more than likely is going to be the, the recommendation to get your COVID vaccine every fall, just like you get your flu vaccine. So that will just get to be routine for Probably, us after yes, a while. Yes. Are people still getting the COVID vaccine? They with are. The of course, they we, have, were? we had the big rush there at the beginning, and everyone really wanted that. Um, and again, we have Moderna only. Um, but also, there were other lots. There were many more opportunities to get it, like at local pharmacies, at your providers. There were lots of places to get the COVID vaccine um, this year. Um, so, can they still get it? And the answer to that is yes, also because, just like flu, you know, we. Um, you can get COVID twice, you can get it multiple times within a year, and if you have not yet had the updated vaccine, it's still good to get it. I know when the vaccine was coming out, we were kind of in a little bit of a mini spike with COVID there in early September. And so they, they do recommend that, you know, if you've just had the, the virus itself, you know, you can wait 90 days to get your vaccine. So a lot of people may have put off getting their vaccine right away because they had just recently had COVID. So if you're in that group, it would be probably a good time now to come back and get your updated vaccine. I'm gonna change uh, topics yeah. for a minute because there has been news about the rising rate uh, here in Madison County, Tennessee, mm -hmm. and Shelby County, the rising rate of STDs. And that, of course, as we used to call venereal disease mm -hmm, or VD, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but um, that has been a concern among health officials. Yes, it, re it really is. Those that latest report just came out uh, the end of January, and it, it is alarming how those cases are continuing to trend upwards, particularly syphilis. Syphilis is a disease that was considered eradicated 20 years ago, and now it's coming back. And the increases that we're seeing each year are just really alarming. Is there a particular age group? Well, it's, you know, typically we see syphilis in older men, but we're seeing uh, a younger generation getting syphilis, and we're also seeing syphilis in women. And because of that, because we're seeing that increased population of women getting syphilis, we're also seeing a really sharp increase in congenital syphilis, which is babies that are born with syphilis. Mm -hmm. And that can be very devastating. 
to a newborn baby. Is that the one that's uh, not very symptomatic? Um, well, and when, and well, yeah, syphilis can, yes, that's right. So you, you can go a long time and not realize that you have syphilis. It can be asymptomatic. Um, so that's the importance of being tested and we encourage any adult who's sexually active, you know, be tested. Um, of it course, just seems like you didn't hear anything about it. You, exactly. You didn't see public service announcements for a long time right. and then all of a sudden you read this information yes. and like, what? Because I know I, I read at one time that, that Shelby County was just a huge, it was a huge, huge problem. And so now we're seeing just across Tennessee and then in Madison County. Mm -hmm. What? So how is that? Um, I guess, how do you say that when you when you say that there's a large percentage of, of well, reported okay. cases? I guess I could, I'll, I'll put it this way, like for, for syphilis specifically, a disease that, you know, 20 years ago was non-existent. We're seeing the highest syphilis rates now since we've seen since the 1950s. And, you know, mm. back in the 50s, you know, when, when people got married, they would get a blood test. That's what mm -hmm. they were testing for was syphilis. So, you know, we, we had... It was a disease that was prevalent at one time. We had worked really hard to eradicate that, and now we're seeing it come back with a vengeance. Mm -hmm. And it's really, I don't know that anybody can pinpoint exact reason for this, um, except unsafe sexual uh, activities, yeah. you know. But why would that all of a sudden, do you think, do you think maybe uh, with the AIDS, age of that that people started having safer sex possibly it, it could be it could be that the numbers are down that 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 might be I would, I would really just be speculating to try to guess yeah. but, but what I can tell you is what we're seeing is that those numbers have come back and and even just speaking with our disease intervention specialist they're seeing a syphilis case every week and yes. so I, it, it is it is troubling and we do want to get that message out there because I think people maybe have been lulled to sleep about these Mm -hmm. these STDs and they can be very dangerous and particularly women of childbearing age if you're thinking about having children that's something that you need to be aware of too because this can have very serious ramifications for your children children born with syphilis deal with lots of really serious medical conditions I mean stillbirth is a, is a major concern and then even if they do survive childbirth you know we have issues like blindness that that are very mm -hmm. prevalent in those born with congenital syphilis the numbers are small 61 cases in Tennessee total for congenital syphilis in 2022. But four years ago, we had less than 10. So if we, continue, if we continue yeah. to see those increases every year, in, in five years, we're going to be really having a, a major issue to deal with. So what role does the health department take then in trying to head that off? Are we going to start the PSAs again, the public service announcements, or start the campaigns mm -hmm. uh, for safer sex? Well, of course, we handle any case of syphilis, and even if they do not come to us, they go to their doctor or a different clinic, that gets reported to us so we can help track the source of that and make sure everyone who has come into contact with that source is tested also because we don't want this circulating in, in our community. And yes, we, I mean, just yesterday, I know some of our uh, staff on the STD team were out doing um, STD testing at a local college. So we're doing things like that, trying to get out in the community, just making people aware, first of all, of, of what's going on, and then just the importance of being tested and also just trying to drive home those, you know, safe sex practices, using protection being in a monogamous relationship and th those sorts of activities that are going to help us, you know, rein this disease in. Good to know. Uh, yeah, I imagine we will be seeing more about mm -hmm. that as, as the time goes on. And so it, I guess you just typically think of it as, as younger people. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised to hear you say that typically, what, a 30-ish uh, age men? Well, historically syphilis has been in, in older men, but we are seeing more younger people. And yeah, STDs are mostly, I'd say most of our STD population is going to be in that late teen to 20s category. Mm -hmm. So the health department will, will do what you need to do about that. Um, a lot of people um, are not really aware of all the areas that the, the health department works in. Um, what, what are some of the areas, I know as far as colds, flu, yeah. STDs, things like that, um, and I, I know you help with prenatal care and things like that. What are some of the other areas uh, your, the health department is in charge of? Waste disposal, for Waste instance. disposal is a big one. Uh, we, all of the solid waste convenience centers in Madison County, we manage those. Uh, there are 10 centers, and, and that's a big thing that people don't often think about. Oh, the health department does that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, thinking back historically, 
you know, good sanitation, clean water, those have probably been two of the greatest uh, advancements in public health. The health department does manage those. We, we, I think I saw our numbers from last year. We collected 10,000 tons of waste, be it trash, old tires, metal, cardboard, anything like that. So it's, it's a lot that we're doing. And um, within the environmental department, of course, they're also going out to inspect restaurants. So every restaurant in Madison County, every food truck in Madison County is inspected. Uh, By the health yes. department. Yes, and, and uh, I think we did 486 food inspections last year. Wow. In addition to those, they're also inspecting hotels and uh, daycares, tattoo parlors. Uh, those are all things that fall under our, our realm. So it's a lot more than just going to get your it shot. It is, it is. To, we do you know. more than shots, absolutely. Uh, something else that, that maybe surprises people is, is we... Uh, we keep records of all births, deaths, all of the vital statistics. No, if you need a copy of your birth yes, certificate, you have yes. to call the health department. You come to us. If you need a copy of a death certificate, you come to us. And a question that we get sometimes, a lot of people live in outlying counties. They work in Jackson. They're here. If you need a copy of your child's birth certificate, as long as they were born in Tennessee, you can come by our office and get it. It doesn't have to be a Madison County birth. To, to get your certificate here. So we can, any, any birth certificate in Tennessee, you can pick up. I want to just go back because I know you are, a, you've had a varied uh, <laughs> career before your yes. uh, role as a public information officer because mm -hmm. you were a television reporter right. for mm -hmm. some years and you worked with the um, Ag and Research Center, mm -hmm. Agriculture and Research Center out on Airways. And this has got to be a tremendous amount of information. What has your learning process been like as you know, how long have you been on your job now? I've been here since January of 2023, so a little okay. over a year. So mm -hmm. I imagine it's been a lot for it you too. It has been a big learning curve. You know, I worked in agriculture for 14 years. Um, and so it has been a little bit of a, of, of a jump to go from agriculture to public health. Of course, I do see a lot of similarities because both are so vitally important. Both maybe are misunderstood a lot by the public. Um, but. I've really enjoyed it. A lot of great people working at the health department. And when you really, it's something, someone said to me, when the health department is working, no one knows. Because yeah. it's, it's sort of a, a thing that as long as it's working fine, we just go about our business and we don't realize that it's even there. But then when you have something like a COVID exactly, or exactly. a flu outbreak yes. or when people yes. need things, you, so it, it's always there. You, you see these things that are happening very quietly without a lot of public recognition that are really contributing to the health of our community and it, it's, it's great. So what I guess just uh, to review, I know what you said about flu season and getting flu shots as far as our vaccinations. Uh, now you keep all, all the records mm -hmm. on all of that. Yeah, we do all the vaccinations um, from childhood through adulthood that are needed, all the vaccinations that are required for school. Um, so, but if you do need to check uh, where you are in your vaccinations, you can call and check that out. Oh, one thing I wanted to touch on, um, from what I understand, there is a rise in measles cases. Are, is this children? Yes, we are seeing about? some measles cases pop up around the country. None in Tennessee yet, uh, but Georgia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, so a lot of different little pockets around the country. Um, and what we're seeing, why we are seeing this, is we've, we've seen a real decline in our um, childhood vaccinations as far as the, the MMR which is the measles, mumps, rubella shot that children get when they're one year old. And so I don't know if this is uh, this vaccine hesitancy has, has arisen out of COVID or if that brought that on or is that or if it's something else. But we, we have seen a reduction in the number of kids who are getting who are getting the shots. Mm -hmm. And I, that's that's something I do want to ask you about, because is I thought you couldn't enter school. A public school if mm -hmm. you did not have all your proper vaccinations. Is well, that not Well, right? you, there is a, um, in our state and in some states, not every state, but in our state there is a religious exemption you can get. Um, there's always been a medical exemption too. And I mean, there may be a very minute portion of the population that would have a, a medical exemption and allergic, an allergy to something. But um, you can have a religious exemption and we're seeing a, a big increase in those religious exemptions. And the, the issue with measles, because it is so contagious, I mean, you can catch measles from someone who was in a room two hours before you got there. Really? That's how contagious that it is. Airborne. So we, it? yes, it's an airborne virus, yes. And so when we, um, when we drop below 95% immunity, that is where we have some concerns. So we really want to get 95% of our children vaccinated with that MMR, and we've dropped below that threshold. 
and it's happening all That's over the measles, country. measles, mumps, rubella, mm -hmm. right. That's right. Yes. But it seems like there's a danger if, if even one child doesn't have yes. that vaccination. Right, right. But, and, it's a danger and, to other children. It is a danger to other children because, you know, we don't vaccinate children until they're one year old. So there is, especially those young babies, they're, they're at risk. Um, if, if a mom has had her vaccine, then the baby should be good until they get to one. But, you know, those, those kids, you still worry about that. There are some kids who, like I said, cannot get the vaccine, so they're at risk. Um, so it, the measles vaccine, we've had it for, ah, 50 years, and it really works well. It's proven to be effective, and I just hope that people will, uh, you know, come back and get that vaccine because it's really important. We kind of think of measles as, oh, everybody used to get it. It's not that big of a yeah. deal, but it can be a very big deal. About one in five kids who gets measles ends up in the hospital. Now, is it dangerous for adults? It can be, yes, and, and, and yes, adults can get it too if they don't have their, their vaccinations, absolutely. And what about mumps? Mumps, we're not seeing mumps so see. much. Measles is we the one. Worry about that. Well, I mean, we are still worried about it, but you know, if you don't get your measles, mumps, rubella, then you are at risk for that too. We just haven't been seeing any um, rogue cases of mumps lately. But, uh, but yeah, both of those, all, all three of those that are covered in that MMR vaccine, you know, we vaccinate for a reason. And, yeah. you know, we've, especially, you know, people of probably our age that went through and and haven't really had to go through experiencing these viruses and seeing how bad things can be with polio or, or right. others. Because everybody used to, does everybody still have to have tetanus shots? Yes, yes. Well, and we take for granted that, you know, that we're just going to be healthy and we don't have, you know, we don't live with those diseases. We've forgotten about them. And, but they could come back at any time if we don't stay vigilant with getting our vaccinations. So it's not too late to get a uh, COVID shot no. or a flu shot. No. What or else, even a measles shot if you what, haven't or had even one. a measles shot if you haven't had one. <laughs> what else did we forget to touch on today that you'd like for everybody to know about? Well, I, I just you know I think the the health department is really it's been a, doing a lot of good work in our community for a long time, um, whether that's with with our STD control, you know, our vac childhood vaccinations, our family planning. We also have health education classes that we offer to kids, well, really all ages, kids and adults. And uh, the, so that's a service that we do want to get out there that, um, mm -hmm. you know, you, if you have a program or maybe a summer camp coming up or something where you would like our health educators to talk to kids about, you know, physical fitness, nutrition. Well, so you can request Yes, a, those, those a are free classes education. that you can request, yes. Mm -hmm. S tobacco use, th vaping, that's a big issue for, for kids now. So, so we have those programs. Yeah, where are, where are we on that? Or is that less going on of that in, across the board or? Um, you know, I haven't seen numbers lately that I w would want to, to, to quote, but I, I know that I think it's a very big concern for anybody working in education, the number of vapes they're collecting from yeah. students at school. Yeah. And uh, so we do want to get that information out there that, you know, vaping is, is not good. Because at first it was like, oh, this, this is your alternative. Yes, and then, yes, no, well, yeah, really it's no, not. It's, it's not a safer alternative yeah. to cigarettes. Absolutely not. So we do want to get that message tobacco. out there. Or chewing tobacco. I know oral cancer mm -hmm. is the problem. So just getting those health, that health education out um, to, to families in the community. And, uh, and then I do want to mention our WIC program, Women, Infants, and Children. Um, that is a program that if you're uh, pregnant or have a young, have just had a baby, that you can come and qualify for some food vouchers. And we have some really great registered dietitians who work with you so you can take the foods that are eligible on the WIC program and, and learn how to you know, use them to your best advantage and feed your family. What's the best way to find out all of the services that mm -hmm. you do provide? Because there may be so many that aren't aware of the WIC program. Exactly. And the vaccination yeah. schedule and things like that. Well, we're a department of Madison County government. So if you go to madisoncountytn.gov, you can find our webpage within the, the county government website. And you know, we have all of our services listed there. Contact information is also listed there. All right, Ginger Rousey has been our guest today. And uh, thank you very much. I know you've you. had an exciting year yes. and so very much to learn mm -hmm. about just the workings of the department and uh, about measures to keep our public health in check uh, in general. So thanks for all that you guys do. But uh, be sure you take advantage of that. There are a lot of services that you may not be aware of that uh, the health department does provide and you can get that information on madisoncountytn.gov and uh, call it phone number you want to give yeah, that 731-423-3020 for the jackson madison county regional health department
Thank you for joining us today, Ginger Rousey. I'm Julie Cook, and remember, you can stream today's program and all local Channel 11 programs on the PBS app, the West Tennessee PBS YouTube channel, and on westtnpbs.org. You all can also keep the conversation going. Follow West Tennessee PBS on social media. We thank you for joining us. Do you have a topic you'd like to see discussed on a future episode of Tennessee is Talking? Maybe you want to be a guest and have something to talk about. Send your ideas to Talking at westtnpbs.org. Include all your contact information and let the conversation continue. Tennessee is Talking is a presentation of West Tennessee PBS with the goal of bringing people together, sharing ideas, thoughts, and different perspectives, learning from each other, and sharing a civil and respectful discussion. Tennessee is Talking, the show that brings West Tennessee together. The program you've been watching was made possible through the generous financial support of West Tennessee PBS viewers like you. Please visit westtnpbs.org and make a donation today so that we can continue to make local programs like this possible. Thank you.